Let's look at the current account deficit, first of all, historically. You may remember last lesson I mentioned that in the mid-70s, Australia actually had a current account surplus, and you can see it was up around 3 to 4% of GDP. Um, and that was one of the reasons why the then government was willing to cut tariffs um, so much. They weren't as concerned about external stability. Australia was actually uh, exporting to the rest of the world um, so much that we had more money coming in. Today, we have a lot of money um, coming in uh, through the capital account and the financial account, money coming in in order to pay for uh, a lot of imports and a lot of investment. Back then, that money was coming in because Australia was selling to the rest of the world. Um, since then, though, you see this downward trajectory until around the early to mid 80s, and there it sort of alternated from about 3% down to about 6% of GDP as a deficit. So the current account deficit is been between 3 and 6% of GDP, up and down. If you look at the dark section here, that is the net incomes, or uh, what we now call net primary income, interest dividends on net foreign equity and net foreign debt, that's been roughly 3%. It doesn't go up or down very much, and you can see that it's roughly 3% as you go along. The bit that goes up and down is the trade balance, this light section. That dark section up the top is your um, net current transfers, and it's very small. We can almost ignore it. It's tiny. But the trade balance, it fluctuates from about 3 or 4% deficit at its worst. It hasn't been that bad for a while. It's usually about 3% in recent years. Um, down to a balance, trade balance. And recently, you've had some trade surpluses, very small ones. So generally, your trade balance is about 0 to 3% of GDP in deficit. Your net primary incomes is about 3% of GDP um, in deficit. And that's been the pattern for the current account balance. Now, why is this a problem? It's a problem because a current account deficit acts as a handbrake on the economy. Remember, we talked about the Asian financial crisis of the late 90s. What triggered that was Asian countries had current account deficits of about 6 to 7% of GDP. As you can see, Australia hits about 6% of GDP quite, over, quite often in its current account deficit. It is quite unstable. International investors lose confidence. They start to take their money out of the economy. That causes a great deal of instability. Currencies often crash leading to more instability, uh, more loss of investor confidence, uh, and it spirals from there. So a high current account deficit, particularly if it's unsustainable, is a handbrake on economic growth, and it's quite concerning. Okay, let's have a look at why the current account deficit happens. Here we've split out into um, gross savings, which is the solid line, and <coughs> excuse me, gross investment, which is the dotted line. You'll notice for the last four decades since we've had current account deficits, investments is higher than savings. And what does that mean? It means that the amount of investment required in Australia cannot be paid for with domestic savings alone. Firms have to go overseas to uh, supplement the domestic savings, and that leads to a current account deficit. And you can see that down here. We've had a current account deficit for all of those years. And this gap is your current account deficit. Okay, your investment minus your savings, I minus S. We learned about this when we did balance of payments. That is your current account deficit. And one of the reasons for that is this prolonged um, investment savings gap that we've had for the last 40 years. You can clearly see it year after year. Uh, the other thing that we want to talk about is also the fact that Australia is having a trade deficit. If you just go back for one second, you can see that trade deficit for all those years. When there's no trade deficit, it's just balanced. We don't have trade surpluses to offset that in other years. And what that means is over that time, Australia has had to borrow a lot of money from overseas, um, generally in, in the form of loans. Those loans lead to net interest payments in the future. Net interest is part of net primary income. That leads to a current account deficit. So your trade balance previously, also your investment and savings gap, they are the causes of Australia's current account deficit. And also, um, they cause it and then they lead to it later on. Um, it's, it's a sort of vicious cycle, a, a debt trap, if you will, uh, which we'll learn about later. So a little bit about um, the current account deficit, just reading through it. Australia's had a persistent current account deficit for the past four decades. This acts as a handbrake on economic growth. It generally ranges from 3 to 6% of GDP. It's made up of two things. The balance on goods and services, or your trade balance, um, and that's 0 to 3% of GDP, and it's cyclical. It goes up and down over the economic cycle. And net primary incomes deficit of 3% of GDP. That's structure. It doesn't change over the economic cycle. It's fairly consistent at 3%. One cause of this is a savings investment gap where insufficient domestic savings means domestic firms must borrow from overseas to fund domestic investment. This causes a financial account surplus because foreign money is coming into Australia, usually in the form of loans or equity. Because the balance of payments has to balance, 
a surplus on the financial account leads to a deficit on the current account. So this leads to a current account deficit. Um, the other thing we talked about is um, the persistent trade deficits that Australia has had, resulting in foreign debt, which must be financed by net primary incomes, generally in the form of interest, um, and that leads to a current account deficit. Now, there are two ways that governments can respond to this. We're going to look at fiscal policy and also monetary policy. Um, with fiscal policy, governments generally don't borrow from overseas to fund spending. Okay, governments used to actually borrow actively from overseas, now they borrow domestically. Um, in an attempt to um, not add to the current account deficit. Now the problem there is money is fungible. If you're borrowing from domestic savings, then that's domestic savings that are crowded out. The domestic firms can't use them as a source of funds for investment. So now they borrow from overseas. So it's not enough just for government to not borrow from overseas. They have to not borrow at all. So if we keep going, um, they also attempt to balance the budget over the economic cycle so as to reduce their call on domestic savings. Therefore, if there is a deficit, and we're talking about a current account deficit here, it is a result of consenting adults making rational decisions based on market forces. This is something that used to be known as the Pitchford thesis. So the idea that if we do have a uh, current account deficit, it's not because the government is going out there borrowing. It's because private investors, private individuals are borrowing, and that's more sustainable. Um, and if there are any issues, then they're the ones who default. It's not the government on behalf of the economy as a whole. But yeah, so what, uh, why does it matter if the government borrows from internationally or domestically? Um, that's a good question. It actually really doesn't, if you look at it. And that's why this first point is actually not that important. So it's an excellent question. Um, the government no longer borrowing overseas doesn't really matter because they just borrow from domestic sources now, and, borrow. and then they borrow from overseas. That's right. So it's more this second section that the government tries to, one, run a budget surplus, um, but also run a budget surplus over the economic cycle. So if there is a recession, as there was a few years ago, that policy actually says it's fine to go into deficit as long as you get back into surplus and repay that money. So over the economic cycle, the government is not acting um, or putting a call on domestic savings. Um, and that's what this consenting adults and pitch for thesis refers to. So the idea that any current account deficit is the private sector doing it and the private sector is doing it because market forces are determining that it's um, efficient or profitable to do so and if that's the case then we shouldn't worry about a current account deficit. It so, should be sustainable. Uh, yeah, we're going to get to that. That's monetary policy. So is it in the interest of the government to raise interest rates to reduce the current account deficit? We'll get to that in monetary policy. Um, one other thing in terms of fiscal policy, fiscal policy is not just a, a big picture um, thing in terms of macroeconomic policy. There is some microeconomic policy involved. And there you see governments can also uh, raise savings through fiscal policy by taxing consumption. The GST is a great example. It taxes consumption, not savings. And also encouraging savings. So policies like compulsory superannuation, increasing it, um, encouraging people to, to add to it. Both of those things add to savings, which reduce the investment savings gap. Um, now, the point was mentioned earlier about increasing interest rates. So that's a monetary policy issue. And the RBA can put in place higher interest rates, which one, encourage savings, and two, discourage investment. And that's going to also reduce your current account deficit. However, this response is not preferable. It can induce a recession or an economic downturn. And we saw that in Australia in 1991, the recession we had to have, interest rates got up to 17%. The current account deficit uh, came down quite a bit. Let's go back and, um, and have a look. Uh, 1988, we had a 6% of GDP current account deficit came down to 4% in a very short period of time, but we got a recession. Okay, not ideal. That's not what you want to be doing. Um, also in um, Thailand in 1997-98, it was the first of the Asian countries to enter the Asian financial crisis. The um, IMF encouraged them to raise interest rates to run a budget surplus in order to maintain stability in the economy. What it did was it did provide some element of external stability, but it also induced a recession, um, and that caused more capital to leave the country and actually exacerbated the issues of external stability. Um, and the IMF learned from that. They didn't make the same mistake in the GFC. They discouraged um, central banks and governments from taking that approach. They said, well, we want you to stimulate the economy and then run budget surpluses later.